All right, guys, I'm super excited because for 102, this should be the last video I have to record. It was this weird issue where I recorded some of them before and some of them afterwards, and that's why this, I guess, audio might be very clear, but you don't hear any student interactions because I'm sitting at my house doing this. Um, but I'm super excited. I'm pretty sure this is the last one I need to record. I've gone back. I've looked at everything. It should be awesome. So very excited right now. We're going to do this. Um, prokaryotes interacting with the environment. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the carbon cycle. We ended the last bit of the lecture with the uh, nitrogen cycle. We're going to go into the carbon cycle. Please note they're entirely different processes. And then we're going to talk about how humans interact with prokaryotes in order to both improve our lives and then sometimes um, not so much improve our lives. So the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle is the sum of all of the reactions on Earth between uh, carbon-containing compounds. So um, going from inorganic to organic carbon and back again. Bacteria and archaea produce and consume a huge amount of carbon. Specifically, they produce a lot of methane. Um, you may have heard of methane before because methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. So bacteria and archaeans are going to produce a ton of methane, but they will also, when they are in great numbers, um, fix a bunch of methane into organic molecules. As I mentioned, methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. Um, it allows bacteria and archaeans to have a huge impact on the global climate. Um, methane and methane traps may have been one reason for mass extinctions in the past. Um, it's an earthquake. For here, you can see on the screen uh, what's called a methane trap. It's under the water. As sea levels drop, you've got um, gases that are trapped in that seabed. If the seabed is disturbed, uh, it's shaken up or anything, you'll have methane being released in large quantities. And you see this sort of on a micro scale if you were to go into um, a lake or a bog and you walk out onto a pier. If you've ever done that, you might see little bubbles pop up from underneath the water. And I swear to you, everyone looks at this and says, oh, turtles must be down there. But it's not turtles. It's foul-smelling traps of methane being released that were produced by prokaryotes deep underwater. So whereas methanogens, uh, methanogens are um, the bacteria that are going to produce methane, uh, they convert carbon into methane. Typically, these organisms are anaerobic, which is why um, the bottom of a lake or in a, a disgusting swamp smells terrible because it's pumping methane out, uh, sometimes sulfur dioxide, too, which is kind of gross, but um, they're pumping methane out. It's uh, deep sea areas. They also live in the gut of organisms. Methane lives in, uh, meth methanogens live in the gut of cattle. Um, if you were to look at the Earth from space, you can actually see pockets of methane above herds of cattle because as those cattle digest their food and the methanogens break down that uh, waste in the cattle, the cattle release methane in their, um, in their gases as, as uh, flatulence. Interestingly enough, there are actually... Um, programs in which you have uh, they're trying to capture the flatulence of um, of different types of, of cattle uh, species in order to uh, then capture that methane and then burn it off in a different way in a clean way in order to produce energy um, so it's I guess a cleaner form of energy Marsh gas is a type of uh, methane release. So typically in wetlands, you'll have these uh, sediments that are trapped, um, that, that trap gases, and the gases get released. And when they're released, they obviously go into the atmosphere. If the moon is shining at a, 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 an oblique angle to the ground, the as the gases rise, the light from the moon is going to pass through them and get refracted. So it's going to look a slightly different color than the, um, than the air around it. It's not completely um, translucent anymore. Now you can, actually, uh, you can see a color, in, usually it's a greenish ball of light, um, in that methane trap, in that methane that's been released, 
as the moonlight reflects through it. And this is what causes, um, we think, the old folk tales of will or people might see ghosts in the uh, marshlands, strange glowing lights, UFOs, things like that, oftentimes can be attributed to pockets of methane being released and the moon um, shining through it. <clears throat> On the other side of that coin, you have methanogens producing methane. You'll have methanotrophs taking methane out of the environment and fixing it into organic molecules. So whenever you have something being produced, you're going to have something that consumes it, and they exist in a balance. It's only when they get out of balance that you end up having major ecological consequences. Now, bacteria and, um, and eukaryotes, like us, can live in different types of symbiosis. Um, symbiosis occurs when an organism lives in a close association with another organism. Probably the one you've heard of is the clownfish and the anemone. Clownfish uh, clean an enemy, um, and the anemone in turn um, provide the clownfish a home. Clownfish are immune to the uh, sting of the anemone, or at least it doesn't bother the clownfish. So they have a symbiotic relationship. They live cl in close association with each other. Literally, the clownfish lives inside the anemone. And of this type of symbiosis, there are two kinds we're going to talk about today. Um, one is mutualism. In mutualism, uh, you have a symbiosis in which both organisms benefit. That anemone clownfish example is an example of mutualism. Both organisms are getting a benefit. Uh, here you can see a, um, well, it looks like a hummingbird, but I think that's actually like a hummingbird moth, um, which is surprising because I was just learning about those yesterday. So here we have a hummingbird moth um, that is flapping its wings very quickly in order to um, get nectar out of the flower there. Um, and that is a native Virginia flower. Um, and the flower is getting pollinated. The uh, hummingbird moth is getting nectar. Both are benefiting. The other side of that's parasitism. Parasitism occurs when one ben organism benefits at the expense of another. And here you can see an isopod inside that fish's mouth. That isopod had latched onto the um, the tongue of the fish and um, started removing blood from the fish. Over time, the tongue of the fish actually fell out and the isopod begins to act like the tongue. Now the fish does not benefit from this. The fish lost its tongue. It's not getting a direct benefit. But the isopod is getting blood from that fish in order to continue to survive. The fish is harmed, losing blood every now and then, you know, losing small amounts of blood constantly. The isopod is gaining. So this is parasitism, one organism benefiting at the expense of another. Now, humans can live in mutualism with many, many, many species of prokaryotes. Living in your body are 10 to 100 trillion microbes living in the human colon in a mutualistic manner. They are working very hard to survive and uh, their byproducts end up supporting you. See, these bacteria can do things that you can't. They can break things down that you're not able to do, or at least that uh, they can do much, much more efficiently than you can do. So as far as mutualism goes, they break down food at one, uh, in a state that you can't get energy from. The bacteria break down this food, you can get a little bit of energy, and the bacteria are also getting energy from it. So you don't have to expend energy to process that food. The bacteria does that for you. Um, the bacteria get energy through that breakdown, and they continue to flourish. So both organisms, you and the prokaryote, are getting a benefit. It's a mutualistic relationship. The flip side of that are pathogens, and pathogens are probably what you most associate with bacteria. Pathogens are microorganisms that are parasitic. They parasitize, um, that is, they, um, they get a benefit, and the other organism is harmed in the process. So these are called pathogens, microorganisms that are parasitic. There are pathogens for every single type of organism out there. If it's alive, it's got a pathogen. You have pathogens. 
plants have pathogens. Heck, even bacteria have pathogens that prey on them. Everything has pathogens. When bacteria attack cells, they've got to um, trick the cell into taking them in, into literally engulfing that bacteria so the bacteria can do work inside the other cell. Um, it's not like they go and often eat other cells. They literally um, sort of Trojan horse themselves in and um, take over that cell's functioning. So they have to target the cell and inject either pathogenic DNA into the cell or some proteins to commandeer that other cell's function. Usually the first thing they do is they sidle up, the bacteria will sidle up next to a, a healthy cell and uh, they begin to secrete proteins out of their membrane that trigger the endocytosis uh, mechanism of the, uh, uh, of the host cell. So that the host cell takes it in in a vacuum. It protects it. It gives it a big old hug and takes it into itself. Now the bacteria or the proteins from the bacteria are inside the host cell. <clears throat> and they begin to act like, a, um, like an organelle. They start to direct the cell's function. The new organelle begins to redirect the cell's resources to the bacteria, and that bacteria multiplies and gets healthier as the host cell dies. Some common pathogens you may uh, recognize are like E. coli. E. coli is a common um, uh, symbiote, so mutualistic bacteria living in the colon. But when it gets into a different part of your body, maybe the upper digestive tract, heck, maybe uh, external, um, it can act as a pathogen. Um, when it's in its proper place in your colon, it helps you. When it's anywhere else in your body, it can cause damage. Another pathogen you may be um, familiar with is streptococcus pneumoniae. It sounds like pneumonia, right? And you can see on the screen, you've got lungs, and you can see these dark spots, these, these uh, very heavy patches on the lung. Those are masses of bacteria that are forming. We have a hard time coping with bacterial infection, especially before the advent of modern medicine. Uh, basically, you just used to have to let the infection run its course and hope your immune system would uh, would uh, kill that bacterial infection off. Recently, well, historically recently, within the last hundred years, um, we started really uh, deeply studying the way not just we fight bacteria, bacterial infections, but how other organisms fight bacterial infections. And what we noted was that some bacteria and fungus will secrete secondary metabolites known as polyketides. Polyketides are highly toxic and very specific secondary metabolites that will inhibit protein synthesis. So they stop proteins. They stop enzymes from being made. Um, but they only will attack the uh, protein synthesis pathway in bacteria. Because if you remember a few lectures ago, we talked about how bacteria have different looking ribosomes, uh, different ribosomal structures, and different RNA polymerase than um, eukaryotes. These polyketides target those differences and they uh, specifically harm prokaryotic, um, prokaryotic protein creation devices. So polyketides are very toxic and they're highly specific and they only target bacteria. Well, what does this start sounding like? Uh, we develop these polyketides into our antibiotics. So there's, uh, these polyketides that are secreted by bacteria and fungus, we've then sort of harnessed in order to create medication for ourselves while we're sick. So this is one way that we've just sort of taken over this, um, this system we found in nature and used it to our own benefit. So we've done that several times. Humans, humans win this one. Um, we synthesize polyketide structures to kill bacteria without harming eukaryotic cells. In fact, um, with hubris, back in the 1970s, the consensus among the doctors and uh, microbiologists at the time was, now that we have these 
um, antibiotics. We have fully defeated bacteria forever. They will never be a problem ever again. Uh, but it turns out that was wrong um, because bacteria with their short generation time and high mutation rates uh, evolve very, very quickly. Um, so what we're having now is an, still, it's not just we win, it's an arms race. As we develop new antibiotics, bacteria evolve resistance against them. So we have to uh, uh, find new antibiotics and just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. Human innovation is a, it, 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 human innovation that keeps moving forward. Uh, biotechnology, the bleeding edge of technology is constantly moving forward using bacteria. Bacteria are simple genetic, sim have relatively simple genetics that we have a good understanding of, and we can manipulate those genes in order to get bacteria to do what we want. Um, so we've had them do a lot of different things. One of the major uh, advances in medicine came from our modifying bacteria to produce human enzymes. So we've inserted human genes into bacteria, and the bacteria are now producing proteins and uh, hormones that we use. Probably the biggest example of this is human insulin. It used to be to get insulin when it was extraordinarily expensive, uh, and it still is, but that's just a function of, I guess, the uh, economy. But um, to get human insulin, you used to have to extract the blood of pigs, centrifuge it down, and then purify insulin from that uh from that pig. It was an extremely time-consuming process, expensive process, and you didn't get much product out of it. Now, we've modified some E. coli to produce um, insulin, so instead of having to wait for the pig to regenerate or get more blood or whatever, we grow these large vats of genetically modified bacteria and literally have insulin on tap. You pour out the um, the bacteria into a you can and then um, purify out the insulin from that within hours that bacteria is replaced and the system can keep going so it made the process a lot easier and made insulin far more available and far safer to use because there's no more uh, concern of immune reaction we've also used bacteria we've genetically modified them to break down oil and oil spills um, as you've heard in the past, there have been oil spills all over the world. Uh, we have certain bacteria now that we can literally spray on top of an oil slick, and it will begin to break down that oil. Now, I'm not saying it's fine then to have an oil spill. It's terrible for the environment. But one of our tools for fighting this is by um, literally spraying it with bacteria and having the bacteria metabolize the oil. The question becomes, though, after we've sprayed tons of bacteria on a very wide uh, oil slick, what happens to the bacteria um, after it's done eating the oil? Are there possibilities of mutation? Does it become part of the environment? So things, uh, does it just break down and die? What happens? Will that cause oxygen changes in the ocean? So we don't know that part, um, and we're still in uh, studying it. But we have used bacteria for commercial applications. We have used bacteria to help humans. Um, it is a primary tool in our uh, biotechnology toolbox.